Hi, hey, hello, hey there. Thanks for clicking play. I'm an irrelevant YouTuber, my opinions don't matter, and I'm sitting here with a microphone feeling some kind of way because never in my life have I had so much to say about something I don't want to talk about. If there's a word for this, help me out. I have no idea what it is. But nevertheless, I'm going to try to unpack the gist of my thoughts here because I figure it's about time I explained why I've chosen to permanently represent myself with this logo right here. Once upon a time, there was a sarcastic intro to this video that tried to capture the deadening of my soul at the continuous prods from innocent folks just trying to know if, hey, have you heard about the fact that Reboot's being rebooted? It involved me explaining with a pained expression that Reboot's been rebooting since 2007 and that there's literally been a press release hyping up absolutely nothing once a year, every single year since then. Speaking hypothetically, given that we're now way beyond that, having laid eyes on the travesty that is the Guardian Code, from its casting call to its trailer and its eventual release on Netflix worldwide, except for, you know, the country that the show <laughs> originated from, uh, the mood has changed and that smarm is pretty much all but evaporated. My only hope concerning the subject is that this awful long-winded, dry, red introduction to this video will serve to convey a similar state of my beheaded, sodomized, and disemboweled childhood, bloody limbs and torso ripped apart and currently being paraded through the streets on sticks, marching in step to the intro theme of Code Lyoko. Now with that detailed image vividly playing in your mind, we're ready to tackle the simple yet spiritually exhausting question Reboot's the first thing I'd ever seen on television that changed my life. You can go ahead, roll your eyes at that, that's cool, it's totally fine, I'll wait. Reboot is a 3D animated Canadian series that aired in 1994 on YTV and ABC. It was produced by Mainframe Entertainment. The concept was created by Gavin Blair, Ian Pearson, Phil Mitchell, and John Grace, while its art direction was done by Brendan McCarthy of Judge Dredd, TMNT, and Fury Road fame. In fact, you can watch the whole thing online for free right here at this link. It was a charming, idiosyncratic show that targeted kids who spent all day thinking about video games with a weird sense of humor and a strong setting. Bits and punchlines ranged from downright hilarious to literally no one born after 1967 is gonna get this reference to the prisoner, Dan Didio. What are you doing? It's visually dated enough that every time a sweet summer child stares at my hat and realizes it's not a Triforce and decides to look up the source, there's a handful of remarks that usually follow along the lines of Wow, why are you obsessed with something that looks so bad? For what it's worth, contextually, Reboot was the best looking 3D animated show at the time. See, if you take a look here, you can compare its closest competitor at the time, nothing, and you'll see that Reboot's shaders and render engine are quite actually a bit more nuanced. It was literally the first fully 3D animated television show ever made. Prior to this, your only bet was live action with 3D sprinkled in. And even then, the good stuff was exclusively for films with a name like Spielberg attached. Otherwise, you're hanging out with Captain Power and the Soldiers of the Future. I vividly remember watching the very first promo that aired before the show ever came out and not understanding what I was seeing. I was used to movie CG being cued into live shots, but this was clearly different. This was something that wasn't attempting to be realistic at all. It was some sort of new shiny form of cartooning. There was camera movement, and I just remember failing to wrap my head around exactly what I was looking at, but also realizing that it was the coolest thing I had ever seen. I was excited at the prospect of like a whole new type of cartoon, a whole new medium to to, to animate with and, and, and to create characters, build worlds, tell stories. It was something that was really different from the traditional older methods that I had grown up with and was used to, and I was right on time for the introduction of 3D animation, not as an accessory for film, but as a self-contained medium. To my young mind, it was like witnessing the first time in history that a story was told with fully hand-drawn animation. I could tell something important was just invented, or at the very least, just hit a point or a plateau of significance, and I wanted to learn everything I could about it. 
By the time the first season was wrapping up, I was learning to use 3D Studio 4 and DOS with a life goal of one day working for mainframe entertainment. I digress, but I guess the point is, sure, yeah, the characters could barely put one foot in front of the other for the first season, but God bless them, I wouldn't have it any other way. I really wouldn't. When it comes to voice acting, we're talking Kathleen Barr, Gary Chalk, Michael Benier, Michael Donovan, Scott McNeil, Stevie Valance, Sharon Alexander, Paul Dobson, and Tony J. The various, various children as well that played Enzo Matrix. There's a lot of awesome talent that went into the voice acting on this show over the years. You've got to acknowledge it. My format. Virus. The queen of chaos. <laughs> Reboot will return after these messages. We now return to Reboot. Reboot is about the adventures of Bob, a reference to Rowan Atkinson's Black Adder. Yes. Well, welcome on board. Guardian of Mainframe, the city inside of a computer, and his friends Dot Matrix, as in printer and Enzo Matrix, as in tiny Italian child. They fight to protect the citizens, sprites, and binomes from viruses who would corrupt and conquer, such as Megabyte, as in digital storage, and Hexadecimal, as in the numeral system. But most importantly, they protect the city from the user, an analog for us, the humans unknowingly endangering the lives of mainframers every time we boot up a computer game. Video games are killing people, folks. Well, not people so much as, well. And the point is that when a game is played, a game cube descends from the skies and drops on a section of the city. All those trapped inside must act as AI for that game, challenging the human player. When the user is defeated, the game is over and the cube returns to parts unknown. But if the user wins, all who are a part of it are nullified, which is a fate worse than deletion. Effectively, since all the citizens are somewhere on a computer and Nothing on a hard drive ever really gets erased. The data that is these citizens just kind of gets wiped and they effectively lose everything that makes them who and what they are, becoming goopy, squishy little slug-like creatures that can't do much besides squirm around, feel pain, and spoilers. Huge, huge spoilers. Speaking of spoilers, let's get into some, shall we? Largely identifiable by its constant attempts to break the chains of age-appropriate censorship in the early years, Reboot from the get-go wasn't so much about pushing the envelope as much as it was about trying to be itself while accidentally discovering that the envelope exists. Characters like Dot, despite being conservatively dressed, were deemed too sexual by the boards of standards and practices. and were forced to have her chest remodeled to what is now referred to as the monobreast. The situation is pretty similar to a show like Invader Zim. So they found themselves constantly being content swatted by nonsensical censorship, including but not limited to an older sister kissing her brother on the cheek promotes incest, and hockey is offensive slang in certain countries. It made no sense. Forced to deal with this endless censorship and board filing of seemingly random complaints in order to validate their own existence, perhaps? Who knows? Reboot as a show fought back where it could, but it was rough. Either way, they still took us on family-friendly video game adventures inside the computer, and that's all we really expected of them at the time. It's important to understand all this suppression so that I can recontextualize where the show goes next. Ending the second season on an uncharacteristically dark cliffhanger, leading to the loss of the main character Bob, an all-out war breaks out. Originally created to fill the role of insert child that kids can relate to, the immature character Enzo is suddenly forced into having responsibility, something he's always wanted, but then so. Thrust into a world of wartime responsibilities with shoes way too big for him to possibly fill, 
Episode after episode goes by, unafraid to end with the day no longer being saved because Robin is not Batman. For those of you taking notes, the momentum that took Reboot to new heights in later seasons actually all started with a chain of events that kicked off in Season 2, Episode 5, Painted Windows. After forcefully having her mask removed, an extremely traumatized hexadecimal is left with Mike the TV to help her recover. Instead of doing this, of course, he instead unwittingly releases a web creature into the offline computer city of Mainframe from Hexadecimal's lair. As we all now know, nothing good comes from connecting to the internet. Not even once. The important takeaway is that absolutely everything bad that has ever happened in Reboot is Mike Zero, I mean Mike the TV's fault. Meanwhile, in the real world, despite good ratings, the show is promptly cancelled and Disney buys ABC. It's the ABCs! They've turned on us! Those treacherous dogs! Fortunately, as a Canadian production, it continued into Season 3 on YTV, and eventually Cartoon Network. While initial plans to follow up Season 2 with a movie called Terabyte Rising fell short, Mainframe's investment in better software led to a massive technical improvement over models, animation quality, the whole show, really. Similarly, without ABC in the picture, Mainframe was free to write a show for ages 12 and up, allowing them to completely abandon the loosely episodic format in favor of an ongoing, directly continuous plot. On a personal note, as a longtime fan of fighting games, watching the different genres being parodied from episode to episode had me hyperactively waiting for the day that we'd finally get to see a fighting game. And a move that would lock me in as pretty much a fan for life you can imagine. When the day came, it was not only the perfect send-up to Mortal Kombat, but it turned out to be the most important episode of the entire series. The day that the user won. Did I mention the improved animation quality? Here it goes. Get ready. The user wins. Enzo, no, no! <laughs> Faced with imminent nullification upon losing the game, replacement guardian Enzo, Andrea, and their dog Frisket play their final hand, rebooting themselves to be recognized as part of the GameCube, allowing them to survive but forcing them to leave mainframe inside of the GameCube forever. This in turn kicks off a time jump to a new story arc where the wandering group has aged, hopping from game to game, surviving in unknown systems, searching for a way home. This was a bold, unexpected direction that made many, including myself, fall in love with the series again, as we were now long beyond the happy-go-lucky days of yore and fully invested in seeing these young characters we cared about start to develop real personalities while simultaneously beginning to see parts of the world only mentioned offhandly in previous seasons. Look, the point is, is that it was a trip, man. It was a trip. From the episode Bad Bob, which on record served, by the way, as the early inspiration for Mad Max Fury Road, to Tank and Tyrannosaurus fusions, to Sergio Leone on Tatooine-inspired adventures in the episode with no name, to the hunt for Bob in literally poisonous airs of the web, to the promise of a true viral threat behind the scenes. A super virus, Damon. She's infected the entire Guardian Collective. To Megabyte's transformation into a Trojan type virus classification. Uh, to the return to mainframe, to the grand musical finale. I could literally sit here and reminisce until you got sick of hearing me talk about it, and then some. Even after it was a wrap, I remember shouting at the TV, It's not over, we've never solved the Daemon threat, and we talked about the Guardian Conclave. You can't lie to me, I know, I've been listening! And, as if Mainframe Entertainment heard my cries, two years later, in 2001, came the unexpected surprise of Daemon Rising and My Two Bobs, the two send-off movies that close up a long, open thread that serves as season four. The process of watching reboot from pilot to finale starting at age 10 and ending at 16, was like tuning in for the Magic School Bus and slowly watching it become Dune over the course of six years. 
When it ended for good, it did so on an oddly open note, one where the main threats are dealt with, but Megabyte acquires the power of the principal office that he's been after for pretty much the entire series. Though, instead of going into one of his habitual dictatorial monologues, he promises simply to hunt and delete everyone who has crossed him. Prepare yourselves for the hunt. We prepared ourselves for the hunt, but the hunt never came. My initial hunch that this might have been a gamble at enticing interest for a new season was not that far off from the truth. There was actually a third film planned that never made it to production, thus ending the story prematurely. Mentally, I closed the book. I was sad it didn't get the full closure that it deserved, but I was happy that it did get those two final films that came out of nowhere, answered almost all my questions, and it gave a personal resolution to most of the cast. Here lies Reboot. One of my favorite shows of all time, nothing, nothing, will take those memories away. What? November 30th, 2001. The final film, My Two Bobs, airs and reboot ends. Years go by. Mainframe, known for this point for TV shows such as Beast Wars, Shadow Raiders, and Action Man, begins the second phase of its life, producing direct-to-video movies for Barbie, Hot Wheels, and Tony Hawk. Also notable is the 2003 Spider-Man animated series, and for stepping in for the final episodes of Max Steel, making the seasons that came before that look pretty embarrassing in contrast. Rumors of another season of Reboot fly fast and loose amongst fans for years, but ultimately nothing surfaces. Late 2004. A Reboot spin-off series called Binomes is planned, but never released. July 20th, 2006. Rainmaker Income Fund acquires Mainframe Entertainment. January 31st, 2007. Mainframe Entertainment is renamed Rainmaker Studios. As Rainmaker, the studio drops all other brands and begins almost exclusively making direct-to-video Barbie movies. As of current year, there are 30 of them. June 12th, 2007. In an almost foreboding move suggesting the end of an era, the Art of Reboot book is released. I talked to Jim Sue about the current state of affairs. He's a pretty cool guy. July 23rd, 2007. Rainmaker Animation announces the return of Reboot as a film trilogy. Collaboration with company Zeros to Heroes is announced as well. A press release details that the film trilogy and the accompanying comic will quote unquote, draw on the fan base to help drive the creative while empowering the fans' voices in the show's direction. Reasonable individuals question the sanity of this concept, but excitement for the return of Reboot overshadows all. Early 2008, Reboot.com is updated with a countdown clock and a mailing list for all Reboot Reboot related announcements. Hype intensifies. A fan submitted pitch contest is held for the webcomic. May 30th, 2008, the countdown clock runs out and issue one of Reboot Paradigms Lost is released. October 6th, 2009, a 15-second teaser is released, briefly showing a much more futuristic mainframe city, a new voice announces warning, incoming game, as a GameCube descends. A new logo appears reading Reboot, prepare for the upgrade. It is simultaneously everything and nothing all at the same time. December 3rd, 2010. After a decade of waiting, the original show finally makes it to DVD. Fans hope that this resurgence could somehow build the momentum for an anticipated reboot reboot and go to sleep staring at the ceiling. February 2011. Rainmaker pulls the reboot movie trailer offline and removes all references to reboot from their site. Oh. November 15th, 2012. Chinese studio Zing Zing Digital attempts to buy out Rainmaker but fails. The CEO is replaced. Michael Hefferon replaces Catherine Winder as the Rainmaker president. September 30th, 2013. Press release. The return of Reboot. Rainmaker announces that Reboot is getting rebooted, but it's back to being an animated TV series. And it's in celebration of the 20th anniversary coming up in 2014. And Rainmaker's TV division changes its name back to Mainframe Entertainment. Fans are delighted at the news that things are going to totally be exactly the way they were, guys. Totally the same. No need to worry, guys. Hey. Fans begin to worry. Huffington Post writes a thing, and everyone gets excited because it's the first they're hearing of a reboot reboot, except it's not. 
but it might as well be because it's unreasonable to expect people to remember a press release from seven years prior that leads to nothing. October 31st, 2013. It's revealed that Rainmaker is bleeding money at losses of over a million a year. It's been going for quite some time and apparently they were demoted from the Toronto Stock Exchange board, prompting the aforementioned attempt of a takeover by Zing Zing. Fans string together the likely narrative that every empty press release over the years has actually been an attempt to drum a pipe in the hopes of attracting a miracle investor. It's also revealed that the new show will have very little to do with the old one. In an interview with Michael Heffron, he states, quote, I don't think too many people would remember what a dot matrix is anymore. I think there's always opportunity to bring characters back for fun cameo appearances. We're very big fans of the characters, the world, but now trying to say how do those characters and worlds fit in today for a new generation of kids who don't know anything about the previous reboot. A follow-up interview with the fan site Reboot Revival reveals that some quotes were out of context, quote unquote, and that old characters will play a key role. November 27th, 2014, Rainmaker announces the name Reboot The Guardian Code. The line, being reimagined for its 20th anniversary, gets touted around a whole lot, despite nothing actually coming out on said anniversary besides said announcement. Huffington Post writes another thing. Fans rub their eyes, look at the calendar to double check to make sure they're not hallucinating that yes, despite some excited text messages blowing up their phones, this is in fact the fifth time that the reboot reboot has been announced. Fans decide to continue living their now adult lives. Elsewhere in a place that doesn't exist, someone attempts to celebrate their wedding anniversary day by announcing the announcement that there will totally be a big celebration coming someday. Partner is told, stay tuned, lol. June 8th, 2015. Chorus Greenlight's reboot, The Guardian Code. An image of a shiny helmet reflecting a sort of but not quite megabyte looking thing is released. June 6th, 2016. It was at dawn's first light that the casting sides crawled from out the depths and beached themselves on our shores. Fans around the world worked restlessly to save the village from certain death by pushing the bloated, gaseous corpse back from whence it came. For if left unchecked, it surely shall burst and spread festering disease, damning all life on the island. But lo, it was not meant to be. For when the naive village folk set eyes upon the great bloat, only too late did they realize that there was not one, nor two, but five swollen, fetid, decaying omens of certain extinction sprawled out in invitation on the beach. Bodies though they were, it could not be said whether or not these heaving sacks of veiny flesh had ever held the breath of life. To call them creatures would diminish the putrid sense of horrible other beyond the knowable. The very concept of endless gnawing pain the thing they call home. Five they were, and in the village elder's eye, they reflected. With a single tear that never fell, he knew their names. He had always known their names. Austin, the skater dude. Parker, the techno geek. Tamra, the intense, opinionated alt chick, Gray, the jock, and Vera, the attractive Asian AI. October 25th, 2016, Rainmaker announces proudly an agreement for a transformative transaction with Frederator Networks and Erzin Hirsch Entertainment, an $11 million unwritten private placement, and a proposed corporate reorganization to create, wow, Unlimited Media Inc. Words, words, language, words. Why do all press releases sound like this? A marketing trailer for a card game adaptation accidentally reveals CG footage from the show. They're promptly scrubbed off the face of the internet. March 28th, 2017. Official screenshots of the live action and CG cast are revealed. Fans take a moment to whisper a question to the Lord about where the money is in resurrecting an old beloved thing, but targeting said thing at people who do not know the thing while actively upsetting those that do. 
It would later be revealed that the series is slated for Netflix worldwide, except for Canada, which would only see the show on YTV one month later. YTV releases initial promotional material on Twitter. Fans respond. <laughs> YTV is not very amused. February 21st, 2018. It is revealed via a series of many interviews that Michael Hefferon's goal with Reboot The Guardian Code is to inspire the kids. It is revealed that Michael Hefferon's son, for example, wants to be just like the main character Austin, the leader of the new teens and the guardians of the show. It is also revealed that Michael Hefron's son's name is Austin. February 21st, 2018. The official trailer for Reboot The Guardian Code is released. A pale, uncaring sun sets on a young bird that hit the sidewalk before it learned to fly. A dog cries voicelessly for reasons it doesn't fully understand when brought to its owner's grave. A middle-aged woman looks out of an office window and realizes that her children have not spoken to her in years because she's become exactly like her mother. An old man with hours left to live feels deep fear as he realizes that he's forgotten the name of his deceased wife. The door shuts, devouring the last bit of light in the room, as the newborn in cradle spends its first night alone and comes to understand that profound loneliness is the way of things. Reboot the Guardian Code premieres March 30th on Netflix.